In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. One of the things that the leaders in the church are doing at this season in our church life is they are meeting uh, to discuss our different ministry areas and work uh, towards uh, the future for those different de departments. And one of them uh, is our Christian formation, especially around our young people. Uh, and we've had a dis discussion about how important it is uh, that we find different and, and new ways um, to help form our young people, that they walk away, uh, whether it be confirmation or whether it be their high school graduation, uh, that they walk away with a good foundation, a good foundation for the rest of their life in faith. Uh, and what does that look like and what does that include? Well, uh, that led me to come up with a list, and I started writing down all the stories uh, that I would love um, our young people to know. Uh, I'd love all of our parishioners to know and have marked on their hearts. Um, the creation story, the fact that there's two creation story, and what that means that there's two creation stories uh, uh, in Genesis. Uh, the, the story of uh, the call of Abraham and Sarah, uh, that, that wonderful gift of a child, uh, the, the, the story of Moses, and Moses uh, being called uh, d despite his, his, his crimes, despite his, uh, his learning disabilities, that he was called uh, to liberate God's people, that he was called to lead them out of slavery, uh, that, uh, that they walked in the wilderness and, and inherited uh, that land promised just for them. Uh, that they would know the, the calling of David, that uh, David wasn't the, the giant athletic looking uh, son, um, but the, the skinny youngest, and that, uh, that he would be called king, uh, and that he also wouldn't be perfect, but that God could use him to be one of the heroes of Hebrew scripture, uh, and that God and David entered into covenant, uh, that all of this uh, is part of the same fabric of the story uh, that we find in the Gospels, and that that we have a familiarity with the Gospels, the story of Jesus' birth, uh, his teaching, his calling of the disciples, his use of parables, uh, what he means when he says the kingdom of God uh, and what that calls us to uh, as kingdom builders. Uh, what occurs in that passion story and why that matters in our lives? And what happened at that tomb that day when the women found it empty, how that affects our lives, and how the church became, became in those moments after uh, that Easter morning, uh, and what we discover from the Acts of the Apostles and from the letters uh, of Paul uh, that are the beginnings of the church that find us here in the pews today. And then uh, the history of that church, how it grew from those early moments uh, and became the, uh, the church um, uh, that led to the Reformation, that led to Henry VIII, that led to uh, us establishing a church here in the United States and how St. James came to be. Uh, and what are the traditions that go all the way back to those earliest days uh, when we break bread uh, together? Uh, and what are the sacraments and the colors of the church and all of the symbols? And, uh, and what does that mean uh, for us as, as Christians? Uh, there is a whole catalog, page after page, of things I would love our young people to know. Uh, and each one of those uh, facts are not just something that needs to be learned so that they can pass it on a test. Because all together, all knit together, it tells a story. It tells an important story. It tells our story. It tells the story of a God who has always been abiding with us. A God who is deeply in covenant with us. A, do a God who has always been seeking us out. Not a stagnant God who's always stayed the same, uh, but a God who's listened to our yearnings, uh, uh, to our, our cries. Uh, a God that has changed as we have grown as people. A God that has met us where we are. So that word that jumps out of uh, the reading today, that jumps out of uh, that epistle, that jumps out of the gospel, abide. The God that abides in us and deeply, deeply yearns for us to abide in him. What does that word mean? It means more than just come together. Think of it as set up resident. God abides in us. God sets up residence in our lives, in our hearts, in our bodies, in our communities. God takes his tent and sets it up right there in the midst of us and deeply desires throughout all of those stories in Scripture that we would set up our lives in God, that we would abide in Him. What does that look like? 
What a beautiful image uh, that we have today, both from the epistle where it talks about how God is love. Uh, and when we understand that, when we see that from the very beginning of time through all of those stories, when we truly believe that God is love, uh, it compels us as God's people to love one another. That in that we are showing our true identity as people of God. And God's true identity as love itself. That image of the vine. God makes God's self dependent on us. God is the vine and we are the branches that bear fruit. And the kingdom of God, God's work in the world is shown and dependent on us. God said, I'm willing to not just set up my shop in your lives, but I am willing to make myself dependent on you. That your love to the world becomes my reflection in the world. Your fruit becomes my grace, my goodness, and my love. That you become the reconcilers, the healers, the advocates, the lovers that the world so desperately needs. You become the fabric. As we baptize today, as we baptize Benjamin today, we make promises that we are going to help him realize that before he was ever even conceived, that God set up residence in his heart. We're going to give him enough of the, the fabric, enough of those quilt patches so that he realizes no matter where he is, no matter what his life looks like, that he is beloved by God, that God rests in his heart, and that God is faithful to him and is there for him and has made him for special purposes. Because we learn in the stories of all of those uh, Flawed characters that do amazing things that God uses and champions. We learn that uh, in all the ways that God redeems and God saves and God heals and God restores. That we are never apart from God's love and God's power in the world. And I think that first reading, it's one of those readings that reminds me of how important it is for us to dig and to dig deeply. And how much we can change somebody's life by opening up scripture for them. It's really a pretty profound story. Um, and it starts back in Deuteronomy uh, with the law about a eunuch. And it, I'm not going to read it for you, but it's pretty blunt. Much more blunt than you'd expect to see in the pages of Scripture. Uh, but anybody um, who has been augmented in such a way as uh, the eunuchs were, and the eunuchs, uh, uh, to be blunt, were castrated at a very young age um, uh, so that they couldn't have any progeny. And uh, essentially they were marked... Uh, as loyal to, in this case, it was uh, Queen Candace, uh, but to someone else. Uh, and so at a very young age, before they had the power to, uh, to, to claim what loyalties they wanted, uh, they were made to be servants uh, for someone. And so um, in Deuteronomy, God, not believing in this practice and wanting loyalty to God, and also uh, with the importance of progeny in uh, the Hebrew tradition of, of us living on for eternity, that we live through all of those generations that would come after us, uh, God's pretty blunt about the eunuch, that the eunuch should never, ever be allowed into God's assembly, that the eunuch is an aberration and should never be anywhere near God's assembly, which for this eunuch is pretty catastrophic news, pretty heartbreaking news. That God's love, uh, God's abiding fidelity that's, uh, that's for everyone else was not for him. That everyone else who has that promise that God sets up residence in their heart seemed to have him outside of it. And so he went to Jerusalem. Uh, he went to the temple to worship. And we have no idea what he found at the temple, whether they, they shooed him away, whether they highlighted Deuteronomy and said, you're not welcome here, Go. He was from another place, and he's traveling back uh, towards, towards Ethiopia, uh, and he comes across Philip, who's sent out by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what to expect, and runs into him, uh, and finds him, and, and Philip uh, and him engage uh, both outsiders, uh, Philip, a Greek, uh, the eunuch and Ethiopian, and they find themselves together uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the eunuch says, can you help me? trying to make sense of all of this, and I see in Isaiah, and he's reading Isaiah, which is very, very important to the story. Because Isaiah shows that God is always faithful and that God is not unchanging. 
that God bends towards us and always rushing towards us. In Isaiah, it says the eunuch, the eunuch who has no sons or daughters to grieve for them, who has no progeny to put together their funeral service, he said, there is not just a place for them in my house. There is a special place, a special place reserved for them, that my heart breaks for them in their, in their passing, that they have a place in my heart greater than others. God has lifted them up and said, they most certainly have a place in my heart. I have set up residence in their lives as much as, uh, as the lives next to them and around them. Uh, and when uh, Philip opens up the book of Isaiah for him and lets him understand that, can you imagine the liberation, the feeling of belonging, the feeling that he is of God and that God has a special place for him? And then not only uh, is he welcomed into the church, but he's baptized. And as he's baptized, he's also sent. And he takes the church to Ethiopia. That's the kind of doors that we can open when we take that formation seriously. We can show people a God that has always abided in them, that has always set up residence in them, even when we can't be right by them ourselves when we send our young people out into the world, that they know no matter where they are, that God is there. That God has set his tent in their hearts, and they can't escape that. And no matter where they feel or how outside uh, the tabernacle they feel, that God is right there with them. And that God has a special purpose for them. That they are instruments of God's goodness and God's kindness and God's love. And the fruit they bear is God's fruit, God's love for the world. 